Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here at SCCB for the first time as a guest and not just as a visitor, as it I did in the past. And, uh, and also it's a great pleasure to be here to uh, talk with Techu and uh, with the public about the one of the, uh, in my opinion, one of the best books of the season, uh, Open City, Ciudad Abierta, um, published shortly by uh, Cuadrans Crema and Acantilado in, in the last case in, one of, in a very beautiful translation by Marcelo Cohen, one of the best translators and uh, writers of the literary Argentine scene of the last decades. Um, the book is very is beautiful in Spanish as it is in, in, uh, in English and uh, you want very good hands. Uh, Tejuko, who is um, at my side, is a uh, a writer, art historian, and photographer. He's raised in Lagos and in Lagos, Nigeria, and now he's living in New York City. Um, has published two books, um, Every Day is for a Thief, in 2007, it was published in Nigeria, and uh, obviously Open City in 2011. Open City won the Penn Hemingway Award, the New York City Book Award for Fiction, the Rosenthal Award for American Academy of Arts and Letters was shortlisted for National Book Critics Circle Award, uh, the New York Public Library Young Lions Award, and the Dutcher Prize of the Royal Society of Literature. And uh, um, we will uh, start listening to uh, a short lecture by, by Tejo of one of the chapters of the book, and then we have an, a small, a very short chat uh, about the book, and then Obviously, Teju will be uh, um, there to ask questions that you can have about the book. So, Teju uh, now. No, it's just on. Oh, yeah. hi. Uh, thank you so much, Patricio, uh, and thank you all very much for being here. Uh, this is amazing. It's a dream uh, to be presenting my work to this. Uh, uh, distinguished audience in, in Barcelona. I've been really, really looking forward to this. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, uh, a special thanks to CCCB and uh, to my publishers and to the uh, U.S. Consul, uh, Consulate, um, all of whom collaborated to make this uh, visit possible. Um, you've all done me a great honor. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I would like to present two different things today. Um, uh, first is my book, Open City, which is translated into Spanish and uh, Catalan. Um, <clears throat> and then in the second, uh, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about it. And uh, in the second part, I would like to present a very, very new project, so new that it didn't exist two days ago. Um, since I arrived in Barcelona, I've been uh, working with, the, uh, with this center here um, on a little project on uh, El Raval, this neighborhood where it's located. Uh, where I have been taking uh, photographs and s beginning to prepare an essay on my very brief immersive experience in this area. I'd like to sh show you a little bit of those photos. It's been so interesting for me because uh, I normally take a lot of photos wherever I travel, but the process is always so slow, and this is a very fast, immersive, very intense uh, process. So it's been also fun for me to see what happens when I'm shooting like a madman. Um, but to begin with, I want to present uh, a part of a chapter somewhere in the middle of Open City. Just before I do so, just a couple of words of, uh, present, uh, of introduction of what the book is about. Open City is set in 2006, um, so five years after 9-11. It's basically a book that deals with the aftermath of that event. But it deals with that aftermath in a very oblique way. There are very few places in this book where I'm actually talking about 9-11. Uh, rather, I have this, the narrator, his name is Julius. I have him uh, interface with the city uh, by walking through it and picking up the stories that the city has to tell him. And in this way, he's dealing with what it means to, le to live in a space that has experienced a kind of trauma. Um, and the specific trauma of 9-11, uh, which the city lives under, is itself shadowed by earlier traumas of the city. 
So this is a kind of uh, sort of buildup of layers. He's a kind of flaneur, but he's also what you call a psychogeographer, picking up clues from the buildings and people he talks to. However, the section I read now is maybe what you might consider a kind of a light interlude through all this intensity of walking around the city. This is one exception in the book where Julius is actually, he's a real introvert, but here the weather is nice, he's in the company of friends. But even in this section, he still falls back into memory to the Nigeria of his childhood, as, you, as you'll see. Okay. In the spring, life came back into the Earth's body. I went to a picnic in Central Park with friends, and we sat under magnolias that had already lost their white flowers. Nearby were the cherry trees, which, leaning across the wire fence behind us, were aflame with pink blossom. Nature is infinitely patient. One thing lives after another has given way. The magnolia's blooms die, just as the cherries come to life. The sun coming through the petals of the cherry blossoms dappled the damp grass, and new leaves in their thousands danced in the April breeze, so that at moments the trees at the far border of the lawn seemed insubstantial. I lay half in shadow, watching a black pigeon walk toward me. It stopped, then flew up and out of sight behind the trees, then came back again, walking awkwardly as pigeons do, perhaps seeking crumbs. And far above the bird and me was a sudden apparition of three circles, three white circles against the sky. In recent years, I have noticed how much the light affects my ability to be sociable. In winter, I retreat. In the long and sunny days following, in March, April, and May, I am much more likely to seek out the company of others, more likely to feel myself alert to sights and sounds, to colors, patterns, moving bodies, smells other than the ones in my office or the apartment. The cold months make me feel dull, and spring feels like a gentle sharpening of the senses. In our little group in the park that day, we were four, all reclining on a large striped blanket, eating pita bread and hummus, picking at green grapes. We kept an open bottle of white wine, our second of the afternoon, hidden in a shopping bag. It was a warm day, but not so warm that the great lawn was packed. We were part of a crowd of city dwellers a carefully orchestrated fantasy of country life. Moji had brought Anna Karenina with her, and she leaned on her elbow and read from the thick volume. It was one of the new translations, only occasionally interrupting herself to participate in the conversation. And a few yards away from us was a young father calling out to his toddler who was wandering away, Anna, Anna. There had been a plane traveling at such a height above us that the grumble of its jets was barely audible over our discussion. Then only its faint contrail remained, and just as that faded, we saw the three white circles growing. The circles floated, appearing to fall upward at the same time that they were falling down. Then everything resolved, like a camera viewfinder coming into focus, and we saw the human shape within each circle. Each person, each of these flying men, stared his parachute to the left and to the right, and watching them, I felt the blood race inside my veins. Everyone on the lawn was by now alert. Ball games stopped, chatter became loud, and many arms pointed upward. The toddler, Anna, astonished as we all were, held onto her father's leg. The parachutists were expert, floating towards each other until they were in a kind of shuttlecock formation, then drifting apart again and staring towards the center of the lawn. They came closer to earth, falling faster. I imagined the whoosh around their ears as it cut through the air, imagine the tight focus with which they were bracing themselves for landing. When they were at a height of some 500 feet, I saw that they were dressed in white jumpsuits with white straps. The silken parachutes were like the enormous white wings of alien butterflies. For a moment, all surrounding sounds seemed to fall away. The spectacle of men fulfilling the ancient dream of flight unfolded in silence. I could almost imagine what it was like for them, surrounded by clear blue spaces, even though I've never skydived. Once, on a similarly fine day a quarter of a century ago, I had heard a boy's cries. 
We were in the water, more than a dozen of us, and he drifted away towards the deep end. He couldn't swim. We were in a large swimming pool on the campus of the University of Lagos. As a child, I had become a strong swimmer at my mother's insistence and somewhat to my father's dismay, since he was himself afraid of water. She had taken me to lessons at the country club from the time I was five or six, and a good swimmer herself, she had watched without fear as I learned to be at home in the water. From her, I had learned that fearlessness. I haven't been in a pool in years, but once my ability had made the difference. It was the year before I went away to NMS. I had saved another's life. This boy, of whom I now remember nothing other than the fact that he was, like me, of mixed race, in his case half Indian, was in mortal danger. Drawn into increasingly deeper areas of the pool, the more he struggled to keep his head above water. The other children, shocked into inaction by his distress, had remained in the shallow end, watching. There was no lifeguard present, and none of the adults, assuming any of them was a swimmer, was close enough to the deep end of the pool to help. I don't remember deliberating or considering any danger to myself, only that I set off in his direction as fast as I could. The moment that has stayed in my mind is of having not yet reached the boy, but having already left the crowd of children behind. Between his cries and theirs, I swam hard. But caught in the blue expanse around me and above, I suddenly felt like I was no closer to him than I had been a few moments before, as though water intervened intentionally between where he was in the shadow of the diving structures and where I floated in the bright sunshine. I had stopped swimming and the air cooled the water on my face. The boy flailed, briefly breaking the surface with frantic arms before he was pulled under again. The strong shadows made it difficult for me to see what was happening. I thought for an instant that I would always be swimming toward him, that I would never cross the remaining distance of 12 or 15 yards. But the moment was to pass and I would become the hero of the day. There was laughter afterward. The half Indian boy was teased. But it might easily have been a tragic afternoon. What I hauled the short distance to the diving platform might have been a small, lifeless body. But almost all that day's detail was soon lost to me, and what remained most strongly was the sensation of being all alone in the water, that feeling of genuine isolation, as though I had been cast without preparation into some immense and not unpleasant blue chamber, far from humanity. For the parachutists, the distance between heaven and earth began to vanish more quickly and the ground suddenly rushed upward to meet them. Sound returned, and they landed one after another, neatly in billowing clouds, to the whoops and whistles of the picnickers in the park. I applauded too. They slipped out from under their tents, crouching, and signaled to each other. Then they rose like victorious matadors, gesturing to the crowd, and were rewarded with our happy cries and louder applause. Then it stopped. Above the noise, we heard the blaze of sirens on the east side of the park. Four police officers came racing over the ropes around the perimeter of the lawn and ran towards its center. One was white, one Asian, and the other two were black, all as ungainly in their movement as the parachutists had been balletic. We began to boo, safe in our numbers, and we were pushed back from the congratulatory circle we had formed so that they could ar arrest the daredevils. Someone at the far end of the circle shouted, Security theater! But the wind had picked up and it swallowed her voice. The parachutists did not resist arrest. No longer encumbered by their wings, they were led away by the police. The crowd began to cheer again, and the parachutists, all young men, grinned and bowed. One of them, taller than the other two, had a full ginger beard that glinted in the sun. The parachutes remained in a glossy heap in the grass, and when the wind picked up again, seemed to give off trembling exhalations. And so we watched the parachutes breathe for a while, while the men were led away. Then, but only after what seemed like a long time out of ordinary time, we came out of the marvelous and resumed our picnic. I'll stop there.
Thank you, Deju. Um, it is, uh, it's uh, very interesting that you uh, read that passage of the book aloud uh, because um, one of the main issues of uh, open city is the uh, constant threat, which is uh, the constant threat which is felt by the character even on the most um, on the most idyllic of the situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, is it the, do you think this is the, the, the uh, character of living in, in New York City after, uh, after you know, the uh, nine, nine towers? Yeah, yeah. Are gone? I, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, this piece, which is supposed to be, you know, in the course of writing a book, you you sort of develop a feeling for, okay, what do you need next at this point in the book? And, that's, and, and this particular piece, uh, the, the, the atmosphere of the book is very sort of sober, it's very solitary, it's fairly grim. And I realized that at this particular point, I needed something spectac a little bit spectacular, a little bit of a set piece. So I decided to have uh, what's more spectacular than suddenly seeing three big white parachutes falling out of the sky. Well, the, the reason I chose that particular form of story is because things falling out of the sky is not something we like so much in New York. <laughs> um, I remember in the year, suddenly in the months following 9-11, the first few times you see a plane in the city. I mean, it's normal, a plane goes, it goes behind buildings or whatever. And the first few times we saw it, it's like you're getting a heart attack because you think it's crashing into it. Um, and it wasn't just aviation. Anything that's out of the ordinary becomes a cause for great nervousness. Uh, there, was a, there was a factory that made uh, Hilba, I don't know, uh, fenugreek or something. Um, so they were making a spice, but something about their process uh, and the wind conditions, one particular day, just caused a sweet smelling cloud to waft over Manhattan. This factory was in New Jersey, but all over lower Manhattan, there was just a sweet smell, almost like caramel. Everybody was freaking out. We couldn't figure out what it was. Is it a gas attack? Is it you know chemical warfare? And it took hours to figure that it was. So anything out of the ordinary, becomes a cause for what's going on. And then, just as that character said, then there's this security theater around it yeah. to protect us from ordinary life itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so nothing can be enjoyed for its own sake anymore. Yes, well, the city um, and the book is, is threatened by almost invisible forces. And being a city which is obsessed with terrorism and legal immig immigration is ironical that the uh, main threat for a city are bed bugs. Yeah. Uh, I've read a passage aloud, it's very short, on which you speak about bed bugs. Yeah, sure. Um, it says, um, the bed bugs were on my mind. New Yorkers had begun to speak more often about these tiny creatures in the past two years. Uh, the conversations as befitted as a troublesome occurrence in the private arena had remained private, and the bed bugs were having an unlikely success. They were then seen in the media carried on their work, even as false alarms were raised about the West Nile virus, uh, avian flu, and SARS. In the age of the dramatic epidemic, it was the old-fashioned bed bug, a minuscule red-coated soldier that was least deterred. Of course, other illnesses were much serious, but um, were nevertheless of great importance among the causes of mortality. Even as the terms of transnational conflicts had changed, a similar shift was happening in public health, where, too, the enemies were now vague and the threat they posed constantly shifting. Is this part of this threat that uh, uh, New Yorkers fear at this point? I mean, on the one hand, yes, yeah, something that's very problematic, okay? Uh, because it affects rich, poor. It's not so common, but it affects all kinds of different people. But more to the point, it was for me a way of how do you how do you talk about the whole host of issues that are facing a place like New York after the terrorist attacks in the most indirect way possible. 
So instead of having a chapter about, you know, a radical Islamic sect meeting in the Bronx or something, uh, which very often is a kind of invented threat that, um, you know, the government likes to uh, sort of spend our time on, rather I wanted to talk about the very, the mentality of fear, of how fear works partly because we don't know what's going on. So using something like bed bugs is, it might seem vaguely ridiculous, but it's also, uh, <laughs> it's also, you know, unfortunately, even if you're facing the most serious kind of deadly threat that takes down two huge buildings, it doesn't mean that's, that the other smaller things in life go away. You have to deal with all the problems of life at the same time, all of them. Uh, immigration and, you know, and public health and, uh, you know, your worries about history as well as being, you know, having to take off your shoes at the airport and bring it, not being able to take water on the plane. Everything, there's a simultaneity of unease. Uh, Julius, the narrator in open cities opposite to you, a Nigerian, but uh, he's half German. Yeah. So the difficulty to say to himself what he really is, is on the, on the main core of the book. Yeah. Um, is it, it was part of your plan while writing the book? I mean, I've read that uh, your working method consists on um, you know collecting notes that you made on 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 notebooks yeah so i was i was wondering about if about uh, if uh, you know if julius concerns about identity mm. are are your own um generally not actually because uh julius is uh, as you said half nigerian half german um and he's doubly alienated from the fact that his father died when he was quite young, um, and he's completely estranged from his mother. Mm -hmm. So he's somebody who left Nigeria, severed his ties, he's here now, he's biracial, he's facing a strange situation, which is that in Nigeria, he's white. And in, uh, he gets to the US, he's not even considered half black, he's considered black. And so it's all or nothing, you know? And so he's trembling in between this, just the way nobody says, oh, you know, America's half-white president. No, uh, it's black. Obama is black, Julius is black. Um, but in the African context, oh, he's just a white guy. So I wanted to have that conflict embodied inside him. I don't have, you know, I, I certainly don't share his anxieties. I, you know, I, I, I know who I am and where I belong, and where I belong is all different sorts of places. You know, wherever I'm welcomed is where I belong. Um, so, but the question of identity uh, is one I wanted to explore through this book. But when it comes down to the notes, it, it's not that I was taking out a note and saying, ah, this will help me illustrate this theme. It's, it's more like developing an instinct for what belongs in a book. I, I think of it like a curator putting together a show of art. I want that painting, I want that print, I want that vase, I don't want that, that doesn't belong. So any, it's, there's an infinite number of stories you can tell about the year 2006 in New York. And my task in, telling this, in writing this book was to figure out what kinds of stories belong. So an encounter with an old professor who has had certain experiences or encounters with a postal clerk who's heard a different set of experiences, maybe something out of the sky, maybe something inside the swimming pool, and to just sort of collect, to be a collector of invented anecdotes and, s and have that patterning function in place of a plot. Yes. Because we should mention that this book really has no plot. If you, if you really have to have a plot, please don't buy it. Um, I don't. I don't like it when people come to me upset. It just. It just keeps going. It doesn't go anywhere. So I just want to <laughs> clarify. <laughs> if you need a page turner, um, uh, Mr. Uh, J.K. Rowling has written some excellent books. I'm told. So. Um, 
about about what belongs to a book about New York. Um, uh, opens it begins with uh, Julius uh, watching migrant bears from the uh, uh, window of yeah. his apartment in New York. Yeah. Uh, it's not an innocent beginning, obviously. Um, any good book begins not innocently, by the way, mm-hmm. um, because Julius is also an immigrant, and so right. uh, doesn't fit into any category. Yeah. And um, he's, you know, he's, as you said, he's black, but not too much. Mm-hmm. Um, he likes classical music. <laughs> not too not much. Okay. Music. <laughs> 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 I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Please control your blackness. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, yeah. uh, Julius is wandering through a city which is not exactly the New York City that you have in mind if your uh, next references uh, about New York are Woody Allen films and, and you know, travel catalogs. And Sex and the City. Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if this rendition of New York City was uh, was on your mind that you were writing a book. Yeah. At, at certain times, it seems that you are like a film director, you know, uh, putting the camera, making a travel log mm-hmm. with the camera at, the, at, at ground level, yeah. you know, uh, showing everything that is not shown yeah. about in New York City. I uh, thank you very much for that uh, because as I very much embrace that kind of vision um, almost like um, a cinema verite kind of uh, experiences of the city. This is why I have fragments of conversation. This is why I have suspended anecdotes um, because, I mean, f- let's face it, frankly, most depictions of New York that then get proliferated in the media are really bullshit. I mean, depictions. They show you this sort of like marvelous 48 hours in New York. I mean, you must understand this as well because most of what's written about Barcelona is 48 hours in Barcelona, all the tourist bars to go to and all of this stuff. That is not, that has no interest in portraying the reality of the city, the lives of the people who live there, the texture of lived experience in this place. Um, And I've lived in New York for 12 years the New York that I experience is a place where people work, is a place that contains a kind of, I don't know how to put it, a kind of effortless diversity. It's not, a, it's not an agenda of diversity of, well, you know, because of the law, I have to have one black guy and one Asian woman and one gay guy. and It's nothing like that. It's that this is just a fact of life. So when I watch, if I see things like... Uh, uh, friends, or Sex and the City, or whatever. This New York is simply not, rec- and most of those things are shot in California anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's just not recognizable to me. Um, so I really don't think I did anything so radical in this book in depicting the New York that if you got on the subway in New York, this is what it looks like. Half the people are brown in color, for sure. But when they make images about the city, somehow they get they disappear. Yes. Yeah. So I I did not even have to try very hard. Just describe the kinds of textures that I see, and it already looks like a political a- act, which it's purely descriptive. Yeah. It connects with one of the main ideas of the book, which is the idea that um, you know there is not a city, but uh, multiple cities compound. Um, of the multiple perspectives of their inhabitants, like Julius, for example, who is you know wandering along the city yeah. and uh, thinking about Yoruba deities, mm-hmm. which are totally unknown for the other inhabitants of the city. Totally. Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, you can think of a, it, it you can almost create two different dimensions of what a city, if you want to give its true complexity, can be. One could be a city is you know if the larger Barcelona area is four million people. Then it's four. It's those four million stories are actually the story of the city. That's one possibility. Um, but another is that for you as an individual, what is the city? Um, and somewhere Calvino talks about um, the, your I- your ideal city is made up of the fragments of all the cities that you have experienced. So there's also this curatorial experience that you go to, where all the airports become one airport, and all the fish markets become one fish market. And all the you know bar districts become one, and all the uh, warehouses on the outskirts of town and the cemeteries. Uh, there is actually, it sounds almost obvious to say it, but there is such a thing as the city. There's a way in which cities work. A city is a technology that has been improved over time. It's a very complicated technology that has to deliver 
services and goods and infrastructure and make it possible for 4 million people, 8 million people, 16 million like in New York, 22 million like in Sao Paulo, make it possible for 22 million people to live in one space. Um, so they are all sharing solutions now. Um, and that is for me as a writer, as a photographer, as a thinker, this is one, definitely this is my subject, uh, the cityness of cities. This, this, uh, the solutions that inhabitants find change constantly, by the way. So uh, you say on another spot of the book, I mean, Julius say that the whole city is a palimpsest, uh, yeah. written, erased, rewritten. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's innocent that you, that the character says so while, um, oh, well, uh, you know, visiting Ground Zero. That's right. So I was, yeah. I was wondering if in New York in the book is not a kind of metaphor of all the cities, you know, the cities we inhabit. Yes, I mean, so if Julius, near the beginning of the book, he goes to the site of Ground Zero, but because of the kind of book it is, it doesn't intentionally go to, to those sites. Again, it always has to be oblique. He's just wandering around downtown at night, and suddenly he passes between two buildings, and there's just this huge gap. Like, it just hits him in the face. You know, he just accidentally sees it. Um, and he, there's this word, right, palimpsest. A palimpsest is actually an actual object uh, from uh, Roman and Greek times. Uh, it's a tablet um, uh, w that you write on with a, with a, s as a, as a stylus. I think it was a wax-covered tablet. Beca before a time when paper is cheaply available, you write on it, uh, it's readable, and you rub it down, and you write it in it again, and use it again, almost like an Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, something like that. Uh, it's a very, very early version of the iPad, basically. Um, except in the case of the palimpsest, you wipe it down. It doesn't wipe off immediate, completely. That's actually just like the iPad also. They're collecting all your information, but um, it doesn't wipe off completely. You write again, and then we have palimpsests that survive where through infrared te techniques we can see 12 layers of writing on this single tablet. It's quite amazing. Some are, uh, some are written this way, and then another is written this way. There's works by um, Archimedes that survives only in a palimpsest, where you have to look through under the layers. There's one of his theories that only survives in this very evanescent form. The city is definitely that way. The process of walking is definitely that way. The process of thinking is definitely that way. And this kind of novel, which is driven by a piling of disparate anecdotes, is a kind of palimpsest. So it's, there's a way in which all these metaphors kind of collapse into each other. Walking is like writing, is like the cityscape. It's all about uh, simultaneous uh, complexities, yes. la piling and layering. Yeah. Uh, another main uh, characteristic of open cities uh, is the poetical language uh, the book is narrated on. Uh, um, being you a photographer and also um, an expert of um, Flemish painting of the 17th century, if I'm mm. not yeah, wrong, that's right. yeah. um, do you think that both of these things were influential for you at the time of writing the book? Because uh, it's, yeah. it's very visual. Ab absolutely. No, uh, not only is it visual, it's sort of obsessively descriptive, and uh, that comes from my visual arts background. Um, in part because of, because of looking at images, but because of the training of writing about images, uh, we live in a ver an image of a uh, we live in an age of very fast imagery, um, and there's an art to actually reading an image. Um, so I studied 16th century. Uh, art of the Spanish Netherlands, as it turns out, um, particularly uh, Bosch and Bruegel. And these are images that you look at, and you should be able to write about a Bruegel painting. I, you know, I should be able to sit down and write 15 pages about it, a kind of thick description that almost becomes like an inventory, a kind of, a kind of obsession of all the gestures that are present. And in the process of learning to do this and reading people who are masterful at this, I, l I got to learn that description, if done 
patiently, attentively, is actually not boring because it can bring you into a different psychological space. It can bring you into a state of what one art historian has called absorption. You become absorbed, especially if you're describing a scene of absorption so that there are these echoes. So that is why I like to d write scenes of somebody who's in a concert hall. and is So we're reading a description of somebody who is concentrating deeply or somebody who's in a museum. Um, all of which basically serves to s really slow down the narrative so that uh, there's an opportunity for something else to happen. Yes. You know, I mean, and it's, this, this is related to my love, for example, of uh, uh, Victor Erice, who does these extremely slow narratives in which then something else can sort of emerge, something unexpected. Um, yeah. Well, um, I got a, a lot of questions, probably uh, also the readers. Yeah. So to give them the opportunity to have to put these questions, I'll make just two more. Sure. Uh, uh, after this, yeah. should we then do the images? Yes. And then we open it up? Yeah. OK. okay. Uh, one of the, 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 the main questions is probably very simple. It is, uh, where does Open City comes from? I mean, um, it was very um, interesting for me as a reader yeah. to discover an American author who was you know, writing a novel which is in fact part of the long tradition of, of uh, novels about New York City, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn, Hubbard mm -hmm. Lewis, mm -hmm. or uh, A Fairy Tale of New York, mm -hmm. J.P. Don Levis, even Chronic City by Jonathan Lithum, yeah. or Cosmopolis by Don DeLeo. Yeah. But at the same time, the book was part of the tradition of the, of the central European tradition of the flaneur, with yeah. people like, uh, you know, uh, Charles Baudelaire, Walter Benjamin, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Balsa, Franz Hessel, yeah. uh, uh, Peter Hanke, Sebald, especially. Yeah. So um, where does authors in mind as you were writing the book? Well, I very much write as a reader. Mm -hmm. uh, reading comes before writing. Uh, reading comes after writing. Reading sustains it. Um, but I also don't feel as if I'm so deeply educated in the literature of the Flaneur. What I found in p people like Benjamin and Sebald was a kind of a, a confirmation of my own instincts, my instincts to, I call it stupid description. Just describe stupidly, as if you've never seen it before. Everybody's walked down a street in New York, you know what it looks like. So most novelists don't bother. But I really bother. I'm going to take, spend, you know, four pages walking down the street. Um, and finding other authors who did this became a kind of confirmation. Strangely enough, I have been, I have very little influence of other writers of New York. Mm -hmm. So people often ask me, wasn't I intimidated to write about New York, a city that countless millions of words have been written about? And I just say, I didn't, I didn't know enough to be intimidated. If I knew more, I would have been. But I'm just like, well, it's an interesting place. I think I'll write about it. If I knew too much about that, uh, tradition, it would have scared me. Mm -hmm. This is the advantage of the outsider. Yeah. You know, you can sort of land there and describe and maybe have something new. Um, the worst, one of the worst reviews I ever had, and I shouldn't read these things that people put up on their blogs, but sometimes I do. This guy hated the book, so angry. It's one of the most horrible books I've ever read. It's, it's as if this narrator, this Julius guy, he's like an autistic alien from Mars. <laughs> the way he just describes everything like he's a... And to, for me, this was such a great compliment. Because exactly, I want it to be like a, someone from Mars who arrives in New York, takes nothing for granted, and goes into a kind of immersive, obsessive experience of the space. So it was supposed to be an insult, but I take it very much as a badge of honor. Mission accomplished. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Um, regarding this, the book uh, is probably the last thing a reader expects from uh, an American author raised in Nigeria, like you. Uh, uh, um, somebody said, um, so it's in the book. Um, let me find this place. Sure. Um, it's, it's very short, in fact. Um, somebody in the book says that, um, you know, someday I'll find it. Mm -hmm. And it will be great. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway. No, remind me. I, maybe I. Okay. Oh. Um, it was 
Yeah. It's always a difficult thing. Um, I mean, resisting the orientalizing impulse mm. uh, for those who don't, who will publish them. Which uh, Western publisher wants a Moroccan or Indian writer who isn't into oriental fantasy uh, or who doesn't satisfy the longing for fantasy? Mm. Uh, that, that's what Morocco and India are there for, after all, to be oriental. So um, I, was, I was wondering if you uh, found, uh, you know, readers who were uh, surprised and, and uh, you know uh, i'm thinking that this book was not you know not too not african enough yeah. or not american enough that's for right. them that's right i mean you know surprisingly there have been very few of those um maybe they sort of read the description of the book a guy is wandering around new york he's thinking thoughts okay it's not for me you know um there have been some but you know that passage you know in retrospect now maybe sort of a commentary really this is given to a character but it's not so far from my own views in, in this particular case um, what is an African for if not to perform Africanness for us you know um, there can be sometimes this assumption from the center from the and the power resides in the hands of Europe and America right now from this metropolitan center to think that we here in the center can be ourselves, those on the margins have to perform our expectations of what they are. We participate in modernity, simultaneity, and individualism. But an African represents Africa, an African performs Africanness, uh, has only certain tastes, and all of that. And of course, I'm completely impatient with this idea. I have only one life. Yeah. I have to do what interests me. I have to be extremely selfish about this. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, the way most people are. Mm -hmm. um, they can, anybody in this room can decide what their interests are and follow those interests without somebody going up to them and say, oh, you know, you're white. It's so strange that you like sushi. You know, you know, you're white, and I find your love of blues music very peculiar. Yeah. You know, but that somebody will always ask, oh, you know, you're black, you're black. How come you know you like art, or how come you like classical music, or something like this, as though you were only there to serve as a representation of your of your race or your background. Um, and if I lived eternally. Maybe I could cycle through all the possibilities, but right now I just want to do what I like and uh, not worry about uh, yeah, well expectations. Yeah, one of the messages of the book, if we can call it like that, is that you know uh, you don't have to uh, play the difference because the difference is there all the, all the time. Absolutely, yeah. uh, I could not stop being African, yeah. and therefore I don't need to perform it. You know, so yeah. Well, I I I, I know I promised there were just two uh, questions, but I have to make a third one, sure. which is, uh, you know, uh, I, I would very be very happy to know about the, uh, you know, the thing you were doing here at the Rabal. Could yeah. you, could you uh, uh, talk us about, uh, tell yeah. us about it? Well, I'm, I'm going to show you these images now. Um, this was such a wonderful invitation to come here, not simply to promote this book, but to come here in a way that is a kind of engagement also with what this city is and what it does. I couldn't be more impressed with the CCCB. It's just, it really blows my mind that there's this kind of uh, initiative and the kind of work. Please, invite me back again. I would love to come back. Um, when they said, we'd like to give you one whole day free, day and a half, to do some shooting in this neighborhood that is here, I thought, one day? You can't do anything in one day. In my archives, I'm preparing an exhibition right now. Later this year, it's going to be in India. In my photographic archives, I have 70,000 photos. 70,000, out of which I'm trying to select 40 photos. Um, so I have to think a lot. I have to shoot a lot. I have to go out every day and pound pavement. I can go one month and emerge with one image that is worth keeping. So what can you do? In, uh, in one day. And what I ended up deciding was, I, I, the rate, lately I've been shooting a lot of film, mostly this year. I decided, I do shoot g digital sometimes, but I decided this time around, I'm gonna shoot digital for the immediacy of the results. I'm gonna have some very intense days. 
and I'm just going to trust the process and see what emerges out of one day of shooting. Engage with the strangeness of the environment, engage with the light, um, try to understand what I'm looking at, talk a lot to people who know about it, and uh, uh, the people at the center here, uh, Susanna and Judith, have been so immensely helpful answering my questions. And just see what happens. If, you, if everything you know has been slow, why don't you try extreme velocity and see what happens? So I'll just show you, uh, I guess, about 25 images that I've had in the past day and a half. Um, and I think there's also a little bit of value in this because now you see aspects of your city, of this neighborhood, um, through the eyes of uh, an autistic alien from Mars. Okay. Um, and I'll just have some, some very quick notes about uh, my approach to photography, quite similar to my approach to literature. I often go for what's oblique. Um, I don't want excessive clarity. Um, and I'm often trying to sort of divide my image into sort of zones. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, while talking to a wonderful high school uh, class at, uh, what's, what's, what's the name of the school? Uh, Pao Clarissa uh, today, 14-year-olds. Um, when you have to explain something to 14-year-olds, then you have to know what you're talking about. Because at that age, they, c they don't tolerate any bullshit. You know, you tell them what you're telling them. And it was while talking to them that I realized uh, some of the, we can go to the next one, some of the major uh, nodes of my, of my uh, shooting, which is that I'm very interested in uh, fragments, shadows, and reflections are three of the formal elements that I play with uh, the most. Um, but then also very much I work with echoes. This was very strange. This is on um, uh, career, uh, jo uh, Joaquin, jo uh, Joaquin uh, Costa. And we were walking along. And so I saw this image. I prepared to make it. Um, and at the very same moment that I'm making this image, we realized why this wa guy was on the phone. Because right next to me was a, was, a, was a hearse. And there were two older ladies embracing each other and sobbing. Someone had just died in that house. And this is the thing about cities. They don't stop. It's a simultaneity of events. Everything is happening at the same time. You know, I arrived in the city around 2.30, and this person, whoever it was, was still alive at that moment. And one, hour, one and a half hours later, that person was gone. So next image. Um, like I said, uh, I, uh, light conditions are very important, the time of day that you shoot, um, a kind of boldness that comes with be not knowing where you are. Um, I went to this corner and I waited and I made a few images and uh, I think this one came out uh, quite well. Uh, next. Uh, and of course, you know, humor is also interesting. I mean, the funny thing about photography is that uh, this moment really did not exist until I took the picture. And if I had not taken that picture, it's like millions of moments every day would have happened and then gone. But now it, uh, it exists. Uh, in a way, like it exists forever, and neither the woman on the left nor the uh, woman on the right are aware of the fact that this exists now, unless one of you knows her. Okay, going on. Okay, that is uh, La Boqueria, uh, which, funny enough, that my favorite uh, Spanish restaurant in New York is called La Boqueria. I never, <laughs> I never knew why, and now I do. Um, but again, shadows. Uh, fragments uh, and reflections on. Uh, so very much the same concept of the fish market there going on. Okay, uh, but so also maybe a, a very a hunger to catch the uh, the quiet, uh, the quiet evanescent precious moment that is comes out of the texture of every day. Uh, two seconds two seconds later the moment doesn't exist it's gone. Uh, if if the god of photography smiles on you, you capture it. On, on. Uh, and of course, a willingness to sort of react. Uh, that's the uh, uh, the arm of Judith, who runs academic programs here. Uh, 
She was showing me something, but I was looking at her, at her arm because it gives me the diagonal I wanted. Uh, moving on. Okay. Uh, this is a very, I guess, archetypal or stereotypical Tejuko image. Uh, shadows, reflections, fragments. Um, everything is present in here at a place called uh, La Capella on uh, Carrera del Hospital. I think it's called. So, yeah. Moving on, yeah. I really enjoy this picture um, because normally I'm sort of shooting on the fly, I'm shooting very spontaneously, but this guy, I actually went to him, I said, you know, can I make a photo of you? And he said, yeah, sure. So he came, he stood in front. I stepped across the street and, and then I waited for something to happen, which is I waited for these two guys to cross. So I catch them in motion, that gives an energy to the picture. Uh, but the main energy of the picture is supplied by this man himself and his, uh, the fact that he's very present. So I don't so much like posed images, but uh, uh, this is, I think, one of the ones that will survive from this set. Uh, moving on. And this is also kind of fun. Uh, this was sort of in the Romanian uh, section over there. These guys were just hanging out. So, okay, going on. Okay, and this is the, from the top of that hotel that is a bit like a beehive. Um, uh, and I just, you know, a vista of the city is boring, but maybe if you play with some re reflections and some barriers, uh, you can get put a little bit of energy into it. Next. Okay, and at the, uh, below that hotel, uh, kids hanging out. Next. Yeah, kids, you know. They were just making do with what they have, which is, he, these kids were just taking sand and throwing it and then stepping back so it doesn't blow on them. <laughs> you know? Uh, now, if you, uh, you have somebody with uh, a fine arts degree and some good connections, we'll call that contemporary art, right? <laughs> uh, a performance art, you know, you make an image of it, we all sort of very soberly look at, wow, so innovative. But the kid was just doing it for himself and I happened to be uh, there while it was happening. Uh, in fact, uh, the Scottish artist Andy Goldsworthy does work quite similar to this, doesn't he? Yeah, so I, I did not ask this kid if he was influenced by Andy Goldsworthy. <laughs> I very much doubt it. Yeah, he's just making the best of it. Okay, next. Uh, and that's that old uh, 10th century church uh, viewed from the outside during a service. Next. Uh, sort of, somebody seems to be giving that giant a medical exam. <laughs> Next. Okay, and I, I, for me very much, I love those moments of uh, strangeness and slight surrealism in the texture of the city, which for me as a photographer has everything to do with waiting. Just wait, find the situation and uh, hope for luck, which is what happened here. Next. Uh, similar sort of situation here, but this was much more sort of planned in the sense of I talked to these kids who were playing basketball, and I sat down, and I, a lot of the shots I got from them were basketball shots, but I like this one because it doesn't feel like a basketball shot. It feels like, uh, it feels like, uh, you know, they're mining or I don't know, something. Next. Okay, and I'm just interested in light, time of day, layers, what's close to us is larger, and the kind of patterning that happens, you know. More than one thing happening always interests me. Next. And this is a very typical sort of layered shot where, uh, you know, this and that and this and that and this. You know, a picture is not, not just this. I never shoot a subject. I shoot the interaction of elements within the frame. So it's this is happening and that is happening and this is happening and that is happening. And uh, this is a pretty much straightforward l layering of uh, events at a, 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 a bus stop. Next. Uh, and I, re I just really love this one. This is down near the water. Um, I was crossing a red light and I, you know, I decided to risk my life and uh, compose an image. Um, and I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Uh, the next, it's an African restaurant down in uh, El Raval. Um, and if this is one of those images where if I had had more time, if I, you know, there's, 
and it was a sort of a long term project. I probably have gone there because that light is so beautiful that this is a kind of situation where uh, a portrait could really be powerful where somebody's sort of looking directly in the camera and there's this red environment. But I wanted to capture the color anyway, even though the photo itself is not so successful. Next. Yeah, this is just, I guess, a bit of an essay on sort of verticality. The waiting here involved waiting for that man to get into position and then a very cut, subtle, very quiet photo. Next. This was today when I went to the school. <laughs> um, this I took this photo while illustrating for them what I meant by shooting in layers. So I just said, well, what I mean is that I want some people close to me, a little bit blurry, and then layers, layers behind that. Um, but because of the marvelous color of that classroom uh, and the lovely energy of that girl, uh, it actually works as a photo, I think. Okay, next. And this was uh, about an hour and a half ago, right here. Uh, I was doing a little bit of shooting just before, uh, but I like this image so much that I, I, I quickly uploaded it and added it to uh, uh, what we're doing. And again, it's just, yeah, I think this perfectly encapsulates what's happening right over there in front of the museum. Uh, and the uh, wonderful use of public space that you have here which is saying that we're not going to ban them because they're part of what we want to happen in this space. We don't want to sort of reserve it for some sober elite people who are 50 and above. Uh, even if they never go inside the museum, they're making use of the space in a way that's positive for them. So, okay, and next, and this might be the last. Um, and again, another uh, sort of portrait. Um, it's it's very hard to shoot in public uh, because you know you want the energy that people send towards you while you're shooting, and at the same time you don't want to disturb them. You don't want to pose for them. Most of us don't like to have strangers take our photo, um, but in this case there was something very sort of calm and beautiful that happened. Which you know I sort of looked at her and you know you sort of gently raise the camera and say you know may I, and then you take the image. And then you go over later and you know, you thank them or, um, and I, I, I like that kind of interaction even though sometimes I feel quite shy about doing it because you know, I don't like to trouble. But then you know, the picture's there. Um, and I think that might be the last one. Okay, uh, so sorry, we've, we've gone on a little bit long, but you know, we had a lot to sort of fit in. I think we'd be happy to take maybe just three or four quick questions from the audience and then we can, uh, put a close to this rather uh, long evening. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is that a mic? No, if you talk loudly, I think, and I can repeat if necessary. First of all, thank you very much for this lovely slide. I was very intrigued by them. And I was wondering, uh, what is more interesting for you, taking photographs uh, of a location or a town where you never have been, because that's a very it's very inspiring to yeah. see something for uh, the first time. It's like first love or first yeah. encounter. Or is it more uh, interesting for you to shoot or to, to write about a town like New York City? Or have you some technique which permits you to combine both things? Yeah. To uh, take this profound knowledge which you have of a place huh? yeah. and also add or create this uh, very special atmosphere to have a fresh look. And then yeah. uh, I have a second question, sure. uh, personal curiosity. Yeah. Why is your main character half German? Okay. Why isn't he half French or half Spanish? Because yeah. I had a half French girlfriend and I hit her now. <laughs> um, so the first question about uh, do I want to shoot where I'm familiar or where it's new? If we, uh, if can you, uh, who's controlling the images? Can somebody help me? Go back. Um, in the slide. Uh, yeah, uh, go back all the way to the girl at the street corner. Yeah, it's quite early on. Bam, ba, 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 yeah, there, that. No, yes, that one. When I was shooting on this corner, Again, keep in mind, I had been in the city for two hours. And suddenly I come to this corner, 
this light is doing amazing things. The people who were with me must have thought this guy is crazy because I was like a guy on drugs. I was so excited. I was like, this light is fabulous. It's so amazing. So the fact that it was new definitely gave me something. Okay. On the other hand, there is nothing here that is typically Barcelona, you know? I mean, you might think, oh, well, we have more beautiful women. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I believe that, you know, there are women like this in New York, too. Um, I don't like illustrative photography that illustrates a point that tries to show what something is like typically in a place. I find it very boring. Um, and so what I've been moving towards is photographs that actually could almost have been taken anywhere. If I don't put any label on this photo and I say, where was it taken, you know, maybe that sign could give away something, but not really. Um, so the answer is that I like to shoot anywhere. I go out shooting in New York, um, and I shoot in new places as well, because what I believe is that poetry exists everywhere if you choose the right conditions and you're present to what you're doing. Um, I don't rule anything out. I'm one of those strange people. I actually love airports. Um, and all airports basically look the same. But I like airports because there's a lot of glass. There's a lot of different kinds of people. And people in, are absorbed in travel. They're places of arrival and departure. And they're also infrastructural in a way that is kind of attractive to me. I had yeah. one regarding the, the yeah. relationship between literature and, and uh, photographs. I was yeah. wondering, as I was seen, watching the, the, the photographs, if you use the photograph as, as notes for further development in, in literary projects, or uh, are they, you know... Do no, yeah, I don't, no. They uh, don't I merge together <laughs> somehow. They merge together because the sensibility making them is very similar. Yeah. They indirect, the try to do what's not obvious, try to work with chance. Uh, you go out, the, the, the image of the, 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 the beer and the, the, the skateboarders, that image did not exist three hours ago. I did not even know that it could exist. And now it does. So chance plays a big role. And also in literature, when you sit down to write a story, you don't, you, you know, your experienced writer, you know this, suddenly you've put something into the world that did not exist a few hours ago. So that sensibility, what is not planned, what is left to chance, what is evocative. And um, Robert Frank is one of my great heroes as a photographer. He said, when people look at my photos, I want them, I want them to feel the way they feel when they want to read the line of a poem twice. You know, that captures it exactly what I want to do. You know, the way you feel when you read an, a line in a poem and you say, I got to read that again. You know, because, because the question that gets asked there is, how? How did you do that? That's so simple. How, how, how did you arrive at this little mo moment of magic? Yeah. That when the god of photography smiles on you, that's what you achieve. When the god of literature smiles on you, that's what you achieve. You know, you find a thing that you've captured it for eternity, and it's yours. Yeah. It happened through you. So. On the book, there's uh, a couple of uh, there are a couple of uh, descriptions of photographies uh, yes. in the context of uh, right. of, uh, of an exhibition. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could describe these pictures that you were showing to us uh, on on a literary uh, way. Maybe yes, but you are not supposed to do so. Hmm. Do you? Do I my own photos? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I be well because I work with words and think about literature a, a lot. My practice is that I'm always. Uh, you know, the great, many of the great street photographers are a little bit crazy. You're always talking to yourself. You're always narrating what you're doing. You're, you're analyzing. Uh, somebody might say that images are completely no relationship to words. But if I did not have a kind of uh, a theory, uh, um, a formal understanding of what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do, these pictures don't happen by accident. Uh, the, the fact that it was that you see that woman in the background with uh, the hijab 
in the back, just to the right part of the picture in the background. I had seen her first, and then there was a ment mental image that says, so I'm standing at the corner, I have the light, I have the, um, uh, the traffic crossing, and I have these marvelous windows. I say something's going to happen at this corner, something's going to happen here. I was there for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and I saw the woman in the hijab. Ah, that's one element. It's, it's happening. Now I was waiting for somebody, some, something to happen in the foreground. And I was lucky something happened. But without this layering of intentions, the layering of the image itself would not have, uh, would, would not have happened in that way. So um, that's what connects them, the fact that uh, your intentionality is collaborating with fate and you hope something happens. Yeah. But, you know, one by itself, it's not going to do it. Yeah. Is there uh, maybe, may, maybe just one or two more. Sorry, I feel bad for keeping everybody so late. Uh, one or two more questions. Anybody? Yes. Yes, maybe it's a bit early to ask, but I was wondering, I, mean, I really enjoyed watching the photos and I want to see more of them. Um, so. You mentioned the possibility of uh, doing a photo essay, but uh, what are you thinking? You know, you might do, might you come back and uh, take more, or might you integrate them in an exhibit, uh, yeah. which I think would be very interesting for us to see. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we can. But, uh. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, so this is the very first preliminary edit, like I said, just a day and a half of shooting. Um, there's a possibility of possibly doing more. Uh, while I'm here, but you know that that time is very very short. I leave. Um, uh, what's today? One day? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Today's Monday. I leave. I leave on Wednesday. I mean, it's, it's it's over already. But before we finish tonight, what I'll do is I'm gonna pass my cap around. If you just put, you know, ten euros, a hundred, <laughs> five hundred euros, if you have it, and then then I can come back for two weeks <laughs> and do real work. Um, you know, we'll we'll see what emerges. Uh, but like that I idea of doing it as an integrated exhibition that uh, that I then present, uh, that would be a dream. That would be fantastic. Um, but in some form, it will be part of the public pro project of the CCCB, um, a, 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 a conversation between this marvelous institution and the environment that it it is situated in that will have contributions from, from many, many people, including this tiny one from me. So, uh, But I very much hope, uh, my next book is about the city of Lagos, where I grew up. It's a non-fictional text that is uh, journalistic and li uh, lyrical and liter uh, literary um, elements of memoir. And I very much hope that when that book is published, I can come back here and, uh, and present it and talk about it. I also know that this is an institution that shares my excitement about cities so okay one last question and then we finish one. spaniards don't used to put so much questions they are shy yeah you so know. do i have to call on someone it's good enough i guess okay. are you are you going to show these pictures to your friends in new york city because they want to believe that you were in uh, in barcelona there's yeah, no sagrada familia on there and nothing that that's you can what see I'm on Woody films. Ex exactly that's <laughs> This is this is the problem. So <laughs> I have to get uh, some people with Lionel Messi shirts <laughs> just to prove. But you know what? That proves nothing because <laughs> if you take photos in Lagos or in New York, it all, it is full of Messi and Xabi and uh, Iniesta shirts. So um, it's funny when you go to the more well-to-do neighborhoods in Lagos. They are uh, Manchester United fans, Chelsea. If you go into the deepest slums, Barcelona, <laughs> everywhere, you know? Uh, I went to a place that was really poor, poor, poor. Lagos is very mixed, there are rich people, there's a big middle class, but this place was houses on the water. But two things they had. They had satellite dishes, they had Barcelona shirts, so. This is the new colonialism, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, like to know that it's, it's, it's good to know that we are still at the resistance. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Anyway, yeah. any further questions? Yes, another one. Okay, the lady one there. last one, yes. Did you want the Spanish question? Uh, uh, 
uh, a Span somebody asking uh, from Spain, so uh, yes. I am from here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, no, I was wondering, do you think that in your, um, in your novel or in your no, way of um, writing or talking or thinking, there is a kind of uh, humor that is a little bit uh, African? Um, this is interesting. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I grew up in Africa, and it permeates everything I do. But three very quick uh, responses to that. One is that in my literary work, my main influence is literature. Uh, James Joyce and Virginia Woolf have bigger influence on my writing than any sort of African sources, because this is a tradition I have. I practice uh, just like, uh, you know, if you play basketball, even if you're in Albania, your biggest influences are American. So if you're writing a modernist novel, your biggest influence will be modernist novelists. Um, the second thing is that, unfortunately, uh, Open City, which is a book concerned with uh, sorrow and the aftermath of tragedy, is not a book that contains very much humor at all. It actually doesn't really have any jokes in it. Um, the one funny thing in the book is very dry and very, uh, it's, a, it's on a met meta level, which is that it's a book about a psychiatrist who doesn't talk to his mother. And I, I find this very funny. Um, but that's the only joke in the book. Um, but then the third thing is that in real life for myself, I'm actually somebody who I very much enjoy jokes, very much enjoy humor. I have a very dark, uh, misanthropic, cynical sense of humor, uh, like those 16th, great 16th century novelists. Um, uh, there is an element of disaster and mayhem and uh, accidental injury that is actually really, really funny. Um, and that's what I'm using. Uh, I very much enjoy uh, irony and the way it can lead to an unexpected humor in a situation, you know. Uh, crimes of passion and this kind of thing, you know. Um, and I'm working on another project that uh, uses irony and storytelling. Uh, so it's not present in this novel, but on Twitter, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of, sort of very dark uh, uh, storytelling, uh, very, uh, which I think some people find very, very disturbing, but that's the way it happens. Okay. Do you like black humor? Uh, do you mean Richard Pryor, or do you mean <laughs> <laughs> I or, or, so. or, 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 or black humor like gallows humor? <laughs> this, this, is a wor this is an expression with a double meaning. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that uh, you, your favorite word in English uh, is, on English is uh, dark, by the way. It is definitely one of my favorite word, yeah. words, dark. Uh, and it's the last word of your book, It's I the guess. last word of the book. <laughs> um, and sometimes, occasionally, I'll check a translation to see if the translator structured it grammatically to end with dark. And I haven't even checked this yet, but I, I know that in, a, in German it ends with, you know, dunkel. Yes. I was, I was it, very happy. It ends with oscura, which is... Ah, I'm so happy, you know? Darkening. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, fade out, close the screen. Um, but yeah, dark is, yeah. yeah. Uh, but do I, do, do I like uh, black humor, like gallows humor? Yeah. I very much do because it's the wrong response. Yeah. You know, something really terrible is happening. We shouldn't find it funny, and for that reason we do. And this is interesting to me because it, it is one of the ways that we cope with the uh, sort of with the uh, sort of unbelievable things, you know. Uh, things that push us to an extreme response. You know, laughter and crying are so close to each other. And uh, this is an interesting thing, so. So, and now that it's dark, even outside, uh, we can finish with that word. Yeah, yeah? with dark. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, thank you, you, so much you yeah. for the conversation. I thank you for your presence here, and uh, you know, thank you very much for showing us uh, New York and uh, also El Raval with your own eyes. Uh, I recommend the book, and uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, the thank you all so much, and yeah. Uh, bye. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.